Uh, this is a children's book that uh, I'm not sure how I came across this book, but uh, it, it's a book of sounds, A, B, C, that you would, you know, you're trying to teach your child all the different sounds. And this is what they say about A. The mule is eating an apple. It makes the Arab very angry. And you look at the Arab here, this ugly image of the Arab. Um, an Arab on an ass eating an apple that's angry. Yeah, the book of sounds. It looks like, it looks harmless. You know, it's a book of sounds. I mean, most parents would want a book like this for their children, you know. Now, when you talk about a collection, I never realized I had a collection. <laughs> it just happened. And that's how I began picking up, you know, posters. And you see things that are kind of interesting and you just say, I'd like to, even though you don't have a place to put it. And you pick it up because you think that it's important. But I never thought, I thought of it as writing. I was going to write books on all these different areas, on toys and games, on comic books. So that's why I was collecting. And my mind was never really focused much on anything except writing books on these different topics. I would tape as many shows as I could tape. And then I wrote the TV Arab based on what I taped. What do you do after you tape and buy a video or a DVD? So I just kept them. I mean, you know, I kept putting them in the bedroom, in the living room, anywhere I could find a spot. I deliberately sought out most of the time obvious images and obvious books. There were always surprises. Our children, they were maybe seven, eight, nine, seven, six, seven, eight, nine, around that age. They could not watch television except Saturday morning. But Saturday morning until noon, they could watch cartoons. And that's how I discovered the cartoon Arab. Daddy, daddy, they've got bad Arabs on. Came running up the stairs. And then their job was to look for Arab characters in children's cartoons. And whenever they saw them, they, you know, we had a split level house, they'd call me and I'd go downstairs. Dad, dad, where's dad? Mom, where's dad? You know, <laughs> I'd have to go down and start taking notes. Jack, this is so well organized. Uh, this is how you've, you've, you've always been organized in, in your work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> this room was a shambles. I mean, everything was, I mean, I had no reason. Why would I organize the room? I didn't organize the room until you notified me, Jack, that there would be five people from NYU coming down to look at the collection. And I had to, Bernice, of course, helped me a great deal, but everything was everywhere. I just stacked books. I knew where they were. I, I could just close my eyes and I would find them, but I, I had to pick categories for them. And it was Bernice's idea to put these labels up so when the group from NYU came, uh, they, they could tell what was what. These are the toys and games. Um, do I have anything exciting here that I can show you? How to beat those high gas prices. Super Jippo. Yeah, here are, uh, in these boxes, are mainly films and DVDs. And, and some I, uh, I've seen and others I haven't. This is my wife's office. There's another shelf. <laughs> I forgot. Poor, I didn't realize. Here we go. <laughs> more boxes, more books, more DVDs. This is uh, sort of like where I do most of my work. As you can see, uh, in order to keep a smile on my face, I have paraphernalia representing the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pittsburgh Pirates, anything and all things Pittsburgh uh, and my family. So whenever I get tired of working, I can always look at Pittsburgh and I can look at the family. My hometown was Clareton, which is uh, 13 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, where we had at one time, the largest coke works in the world. And more pollution per square inch uh, than most cities. What I remember most is that there would always be someone in our home, and the coffee pot was on continuously. And people would come in and sit and talk. And we had all this exposure 
to all these different people. And I thought that's how everyone lived, you know. No one ever said, I'm coming over for dinner or I'm coming over. People would pop in, next thing you know, would be having lunch with these people. Uh, growing up in the neighborhood uh, was wonderful. It was a great ethnic mix. The best thing about it is we played sandlot football. The cemetery grave diggers, so tough. Ha, we weren't very tough. But I could probably go on and on about my past. But I think the most important thing was family and the love that existed in our family. My father left my mother when we were children. I mean, I have a younger brother and a younger sister. But I had a good childhood, in spite of the fact that my father was not around. And I think, again, it goes back to that environment of being surrounded by aunts and uncles, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother, making sure that because there was no father, that the three of us would be taken care of and looked after. Well, actually, um, we had met about seven or eight years before we started dating. He came to church in Los Angeles, St. Nicholas Cathedral, which I was a member of, and, you know, just didn't pay attention to each other at all. And then he was drafted and went to Germany and sent a postcard to our youth group. I was a historian then, and I got this postcard from this Jack Shaheen, and I didn't remember who he was. <laughs> so I wish I had that postcard now. But anyway, um, he served in the service for two years, and then he worked for our government over there for three and a half years. And then he went and got his master's. So. After all of that, he came back to L.A. After church every Sunday, different friends would introduce us. And um, I liked his blue eyes. And <laughs> my sister was a deputant, uh, and it's a black, black tie affair. And, you know, I didn't want to go to that alone. And I thought Jack looked handsome and thought I'd like to get to know him. So I asked him to go to this sweetheart ball. And he said yes, and the following week I was going out of town with my girlfriends, and then next week was the sweetheart ball, and I wasn't sure he understood that, you know, that, that I had asked him out, and so I, I was kind of worried that I really didn't have a date. But during the week he called and he asked what color dress I was wearing. He said, I'm going to bring you daisies. So he came and um, he brought me a corsage of orchids. But daisies became our flower, you know, so. Anyways, uh, everybody thought we had been dating forever when they saw us as a couple and we never stopped dating. In fact, we got married um, 11 months later. Well, he received the Fulbright, and so that was to teach at the American uh, University in Beirut, AUB. Yes, we took the whole family to Lebanon, 74, 75. They were, at that time, six and seven. They came to know their family from where their grandparents came from. And they met their aunt, who they have an aunt there. They interacted with the children of the village, and they climbed olive trees and shook shook the trees where the olives would fall on the mats, and they played you know, with their marbles in the village and ran around, you know. So it wasn't just going to the American school in Beirut. On weekends, we would be in the village. We realized when we were over there that the Arabs that we were meeting in the Middle East were nothing like what we were seeing in the movies and on television. Here I am with a PhD, right? I'm, let's see, 1975, I'm 40 years of age? Yeah, we're... I'm 40. And I'm as ignorant, I can say that openly, about what's going on in that region as most Americans. Mm -hmm. I simply didn't know. I came back really aware and very interested in this issue, and I decided I would write an article about mm -hmm. um, Hollywood's uh, Arabs on television. And I went to the library looking for books about TV images of Arabs. There were none. 
I was very active in our research and projects. I was well respected. I was hot stuff at SI, you know. I was really, you know, Jack, go get him, Jack, you know, because I was doing a lot. I was, you know, I was, I loved teaching, loved my students. My research was, you know, public TV, children's programming, nuclear war films, go get him, Jack. Now all of a sudden I'm doing Arabs. And I can't get funding. So I had this wall of resistance you know, within the university. And I became, in some circles, the Arab professor, That's right. which hurt. You know, I give speeches. Remember, I gave a speech in Flint or Detroit, and, 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 and the next day, Arab professor talks about, and I know what you're talking about, Arab professor. You know, I'm doing all of this, no graduate assistance. I mean, my wife, Bernice, thank God, was the only, the only person helping me. So I had I had no one really to count on to read and find, take notes, and to assist me in this process. And it's a very time-consuming process because you're inundated with all these images. You know, you're just, you know, and some people would say, Jack, why did you watch all those films? Well, how can you not? How can you do an honest assessment uh, it, without watching? I think today there's more awareness of the problem. You know, the literature's out there. I mean, not only my books, but other scholars are beginning to write about it and talk about it. There's still a long way to go. This is a tired stereotype. We have to remember these images have been with us for more than a century. On the other hand, there are so many stories out there. There's an increased presence in the media of Arab and Muslim Americans. And these young people have been the ones that have been damaged by the stereotype. And I think they're determined to make a change. Now these young filmmakers, they're not gonna sugarcoat the image. Just like African American filmmakers when they started out in Asians, they didn't come out with, look how pretty. It's going to be different. It's gonna be, as it should be, a variety of images, a blend of portraits. Even when I started doing the research on Arab images, I saw myself as someone who was trying to reveal a gross injustice. But in order to move things and shake things up, I had to document it. And I think the collection, what the collection can do, is motivate young scholars to write about issues that no one has touched on. There's something to be said about breaking fresh ground. You know, hey, no one's done this. I'll be the first, you know.